Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today I have another special guest on the channel. I've got uh, Nevin Freeman here from uh, Reserve to talk about stable coins. Um, so stable coins are a pretty, pretty hot topic in the uh, crypto space and the decentralized space, and that's a, something I'm very excited to hear more about from Nevin. Um, so welcome, Nevin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so before we maybe jump into uh, talking really specifically about stable coins, you want to just give a quick elevator pitch for Reserve? Yeah, sure. So uh, Reserve is a fully decentralized stable coin. Um, so everything um, about our protocol operates autonomously on the blockchain. Um, and, uh, and we think that um, a cryptocurrency needs to be fully decentralized to, to really fulfill the, the true vision of um, uh, sort of um, being supported even if the government institutions that normally support currency are, are failing. And that's part of what we're doing. Very cool. So maybe you want to unpack that a little bit. Um, you know, how are you actually going about creating a stable coin? And maybe, maybe what led you to this? Yeah, good question. So, um, so I got excited about Bitcoin in 2011 um, because, uh, you know, I heard about the design and, and it was really inspiring to think of the possibility of um, a cryptocurrency, a currency that's just supported by people all around the world. Um, that you know where it's governed by code and um, and so it doesn't depend on any normal human institution to function and um, and so essentially um, that got me wondering whether you could create a cryptocurrency that worked more like normal money um, the concern with Bitcoin for me always was that it would either be deflationary or volatile in the long term because the more it gets adopted the more that sort of changes the, the market demand and thus the price um, and so uh, reserve is really just our attempt to kind of fulfill the original basic vision of cryptocurrency. Um, and we think that there are lots of really interesting applications inside of the crypto space that people talk about a lot. Obviously, you know, um, competing with Tether um, and providing a, a token for people using distributed apps to, to spend a stable currency um, and uh, being a, a useful currency for crowdfunding and so on. Um, but we think that the, the real big win, um, the thing that we get really excited about is offering a stable currency to people in the developing world, where currencies are often highly inflationary. Uh, there's like 16 countries right now with pretty high inflation. Um, and if we can offer a virtual currency to those people, um, we think we can give them the ability to save um, and sort of conduct economic activity, receive and make investments and so on in a way that they can't right now. Um, and, and that's something that um, if we can achieve that, that, that'd be really exciting. Very cool. So maybe educate us a little bit on uh, you know how the stable coin actually works. I mean, how do you keep a price the same with a cryptocurrency like this? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, so we've sort of answered that question by looking at the history of fiat currencies, where when a, a small country is starting a new currency, they'll really frequently implement what's called an exchange rate peg, and the point of an exchange rate peg is to basically like take the stability from some other currency and kind of import it into your currency, either permanently or at least for a while while people are getting used to your new currency. And um, a lot of people don't really know the details of how an exchange rate peg typically works. Some people think that it's like a, a law that says that a currency has to be worth the same amount as some other currency. Um, and, and sometimes there are laws like that, but more fundamentally, um, an exchange rate peg is a market-based mechanism where um, the way that it, it typically works is a government will hold a bunch of assets in reserve, uh, say dollars, if they're paying to the dollar. Um, and the government will just say, um, you know, anytime you want to trade this local currency for dollars, we will always do that at a certain rate. Um, and anyone, anytime you want to trade dollars for this local currency, we'll also do that at the same rate. And um, as long as the, that government has enough dollars in its bank account, then it can always fulfill that promise. It can always trade the currency for dollars. Um, and then the easy part is uh, trading dollars to the currency because they can just mint more of their own currency. So they'll never run out of their own currency. The question is just whether they'll run out of dollars in that scenario. Now, there's this, um, there's this force that is a little bit hard to understand if you haven't thought it through before, that I think is really neat and really interesting to think about, 
which is um, it's the same force that keeps the price of Bitcoin roughly the same across many different exchanges, which is if you can buy something for a little bit less somewhere and sell it for a little bit more somewhere else, um, that's an arbitrage opportunity, that instantaneous ability to buy for less and sell for more. Um, sometimes people think of arbitrage as just simply buying low and selling high, but really it's when you can do it at the exact same time. And so if the price of Bitcoin is like a little bit lower here and a little bit higher here, people will buy it here and sell it here at the same time. But if you buy it here, that purchase brings the price up. And if you sell it here, that purchase brings the price down. Sure. That sale brings the price down. And so if you're a country and you're offering the option to trade dollar, you know, between dollars or euros or some other currency and your local currency at that particular rate, um, the same sort of force occurs where anytime the market price on some other exchange between dollars and that currency diverges, um, there will be that arbitrage opportunity. And so someone can trade with the central, the central bank or whoever it is of that country and then simultaneously make a trade on that other, that other exchange and that brings the prices back into line. And so then as long as that government is the one that has sort of the most ammunition to do those trades over and over again, that brings all of the different exchanges in the world in line with that price that the government is exchanging you know, between its currency and whatever currency it's paying to. It's kind of the anchor that holds them all together. Sure. And fundamentally, economically, that's how um, an exchange rate pay works. And so um, what this means is that you can analyze the effectiveness of any exchange rate peg by just asking two very simple questions, and this is really neat. Um, one question is just uh, the, the sort of total value of the assets that they hold in reserve, um, because again, if you were to be making those trades and eventually run out of dollars or euros or whatever it is, then you'd stop being able to stabilize the market because you can't offer that trade anymore. Um, and so people talk about like the percentage of assets held in reserve. In some cases in the past, countries have had like 30% um, of the total value of their currency held in reserve. But that means that is if 30% of the holders of that currency want to trade out of it, um, then they would run out of money and stop being able to maintain that peg. And that's happened um, in, in various places around the world. So number one is the size of the reserve. Number two is the credibility of the promise to actually spend those assets depending the peg, right? Because it could be that you have 100% held in reserve, but if you don't actually continually spend that money to, to, to do those market transactions, then you'll stop having that influence on the market. And sometimes governments, um, sometimes governments will have some reason to hold that money because they want to spend it on something else, um, or there's some political reason why they want to hold that money. Um, and so, so essentially, if if a currency peg, if there's enough assets available in reserve, and uh, the, the, the person, or in this case code, that's um, implementing the peg is always willing to spend those assets, um, then the currency peg won't break. Um, and so I encourage people when they're looking at stablecoin designs and thinking about how they work, to try to figure out, well, what is the reserve in this system? Um, what are the assets that can be used to buy up the currency if, it, if they need to? And um, how reliable is the process that will buy up those those units of currency? Um, so that's kind of like a major fundamental premise that um, that has been part of what guided us to design our, our protocol the way we did. Very cool. So how does your protocol differ from something like Tether? Yeah, so, um, so we can analyze Tether in this framework. So um, let's assume for the sake of conversation that Tether is holding 100% of the dollars um, sure. to back to back the Tether tokens. Um, so then in that situation, um, they're doing great, uh, potentially at least, um, on having a, a, the, the right size of the reserve. Um, but then we see that the credibility of the promise is the part that's the issue because people can't necessarily tell that they're there. They can't necessarily tell that those dollars will be spent um, to, to repurchase the tokens and maintain that peg. In our situation, what we do is um, uh, it's, it's all on chain. So there are assets that are held in reserve. Um, and there's sufficient assets in order to be able to repurchase um, our, the tokens that comprise their normal currency. And because it's all operated by a smart contract, um, any time uh, that token needs to be repurchased to raise the price, that's just something that happens in an automated way. So this means that people can just look at our smart contract and see the assets that are there, and then they can also read the code and see that any time it's necessary, um, that smart contract will implement that trade. Very cool. So, 
you mentioned earlier, you know, potentially integrating something like this into uh, a decentralized application ecosystem, uh, maybe for payment or things like that. Um, you want to elaborate on that a little more, like how that could be possible? Yeah, so we think that there are kind of two stages here. So if you look at um, a lot of decentralized applications now, uh, at least the ones in development, um, they typically all use their own token. And so um, usually those tokens are designed in such a way where the price won't be stable. It will appreciate if that app gets popular and maybe depreciate if it loses popularity. Um, and this is, you know, if this has its appeal, um, people like speculating on, on crypto assets. Um, uh, but then the way we see it, if you're someone who's interacting with one of those, one of those applications, um, when you're not interacting with the app, you may or may not want to hold that token because sure. you might think it will go down in value. If you think it will go up in value, maybe you want to keep it. Um, and so one use for a stable coin is uh, something that people can easily trade into when they're not using whatever other tokens um, are, are implemented inside of distributed apps. But then we have also heard from a bunch of distributed app builders that they would like to just use a stable cryptocurrency right inside of the app. Um, and so, uh, so in our case, you know, we'll be launching on top of Ethereum, and so there'll be this Ethereum token that's nice and stable, and apps can be designed to just take that token as a, as a form of payment, a medium of exchange. Um, and so that requires a different business model for these distributed app developers. They don't make money on the appreciation of a token. Um, they would make money in terms of fees um, or some other business model that's a little bit more similar to a normal internet application. Um, but, but I guess one important point there is that anytime you, so one is just, if you're a customer, it's maybe just more practical to have a single currency that you use across a bunch of different apps, so you don't have to be constantly trading back and forth. Um, and it's practical to sort of not have to think about pricing in a complicated way. The prices are all denominated in something that doesn't change. Um, but then um, it's also the case that any distributed app that requires locking up collateral in a smart contract for some period of time, uh, you don't want to lock up collateral where the value of that collateral might change. It's more convenient if you're locking up collateral um, that's that's going to stay stable in value. Because let's say you're like making a bet um, or you're staking in order to vote or something, um, you want to know that uh, the sort of variables of the situation have to do with the app, not just like the change in value of that currency. Sure, very cool. Yeah, I've already seen this a lot with um, you know a lot of blockchain games and things like that that are already doing you know in-game currencies and plugging in like that, and that uh, definitely sounds like. Uh, 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 it, appealing proposition to have something that is, is stable that we know we can you know come coming back and forth without having any value change so do you do you see this as um, something that's really going to push uh, uh, mass adoption for um, distri distributed applications or internet money or things like that yeah I think I think that it will certainly be um, a useful step in that direction um, and you know people ask us a lot um, how are you going to get people to start using this to, to buy goods on the internet or or to like you know buy coffee at Starbucks? Um, and interestingly, I think that adoption is going to start um, in in the developing world because in in the U.S. or in other countries that have um, altogether pretty functional currencies, there isn't necessarily a reason to switch to cryptocurrency. It has some benefits. It's like in some cases cheaper to send and um, you can send it across borders pretty fast, and so that can be pretty helpful. Um, but for a lot of our day-to-day -day transactions, the current you know, currency system is pretty good. But if you imagine you're someone in a country where there's like 20% or 30% or 40% inflation per year, that's, that's essentially like you have to pay 20 or 40% taxes on all of your money, not just your in, on any money you have every single year. Um, and so that makes it a really unappealing proposition to save money. Um, and so we're excited about the idea of being able to essentially offer people a, a stable savings account on their phone. Um, and we think that we can make it harder to steal than cash. So places that often deal in cash, there's like a benefit of it being harder to steal. Um, we can make it accessible to people who don't have bank accounts. Oftentimes the reason why a person doesn't have a bank account is because they don't have a government issued ID number. And so it just makes it hard to get into the banking system. Sure. And part of the beauty of cryptocurrency is you don't need that. You can just create a key on, on your computer or your phone right. and now you're you know, in the open system. Um, and so we think that uh, the sort of like mass adoption will probably start in those areas where, um, where the currency is really non-functional and, and the thing that we can provide is actually much better. Very cool. Very cool. 
Well, uh, Nevin, I really enjoyed uh, those explanations. Um, where uh, can we find more about Reserve? Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to be putting more information on the internet in the coming months, but you can find us at reserveprotocol.com. Um, there's a little bit of information about us there now. Um, and uh, we'll be opening up a Telegram channel to, to talk more to the people in the, in the community about what we're up to. Yeah, and um, I, you and I spoke earlier, you mentioned that you have got some uh, exciting backers behind the project. Is that something you can share with us? Um, unfortunately, they're still a secret, um, sure. but they are very exciting, and we'll be talking about that pretty soon. Yeah. Are there any um, non-secrets on the roadmap that you can share with us, or is it all pretty hush-hush at this point? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, from the internal development perspective, um, it's, it's been pretty exciting for us. We have, uh, you know, a whole version of our smart contracts running with our simulator. So we have like a simulated exchange and a bunch of like simulated traders and we can see the graphs of how it works. And we just started testing that on the public test net um, a few days ago. Um, so it's not live for people to interact with out in the world yet, um, but we're getting there. Cool. Awesome. Well, I really enjoyed our chat today, Nevin. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like for the people watching to know? I would say that if you really want to understand um, how stable coins work, which is a complicated thing, um, well, okay. So, so I, I think I think it's really important to look at the lessons that can be learned from the history of monetary economics, and, and in particular, go study exchange rate pegs. It's super fascinating. It's totally worthwhile. And I would, I would leave you with just the idea that right now in the evolution of decentralized stablecoin design, it's not like we're in the era, the era right after Bitcoin was created and there are lots of copycats. All these projects that are coming out, um, it's like we're in the pre-Bitcoin era where no one has actually cracked proof of work yet. And, um, and someone, you know, everyone is trying to figure out, can we do this technologically at all? Um, and so that means that you really have to look closely at the technological approach to any one of these projects to try to see where it's going to go. Um, so I, I offer that as a metaphor for kind of how to think about the point that we're at in this overall evolution. Very cool. Very cool. I like that. Well, Nevin, I've enjoyed our chat today. Everyone, uh, stay tuned for more from Reserve. Um, I hope everyone found this as educational and exciting as I have. Um, so be sure to subscribe to the channel for updates on the project and for more calls like this from uh, talking to people like Nevin who are in the uh, cryptocurrency and decentralized space and who are you know, building things with Ethereum. So until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.